Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. You have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let them have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You can be seated. Thanks, Owen. All right, so we are, uh, good morning. I'm Mike Young. I get to serve here on staff as a, all right, that's, I'm done then. That's all I was here for. Just, I can be done. I'll just tell some jokes now. Um, I get to serve here on staff as the operations director, so um, occasionally I get to teach and lead worship. And so in between my spreadsheets and databases this week, I tried to cobble together a little bit of a talk um, because this is a tough one. I mean, it's not as tough as the ones we have done. So I really appreciate Travis not tapping me on the shoulder to teach on uh, lust or divorce or something. But this is another tough teaching from Jesus. We're studying the book of Matthew and we're right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, which is really his moment to lay out what he wants for this community of disciples, how we're supposed to live uh, together. So we've already heard from him on anger and lust and divorce and adultery. Um, And now this text about how his followers, his disciples, those who are being shaped into his image should act in the face of persecution. And this is tough because I don't know if you've noticed, but it's a little bit gnarly out there right now. Um, You could say that conflict is uh, everywhere. Tensions are high. Um, I mean, I just know a handful of stories in this room. And if we could pass the mic around, people in this room have walked through hardship, have had wrongs done to them. This isn't just a trite uh, little verse to put on the wall. I mean, this is really rubber hits the road discipleship because uh, things are difficult right now. And these difficult words from Jesus, I hope, will bring some comfort and life to us. So could we just pause and pray, and then we'll uh, get into it today. Jesus, we love you, trust you, even when we don't understand all that you're saying or what you're doing. We say we trust you. We're with you, Lord. We're consenting to be shaped into your image. We are signing up to be uh, followers of yours. And so would your word shape us today? Would you Lead us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So here Jesus is apparently telling us to not get revenge, to not be those who get evil. And at first glance, I don't really like these words that he's given us. Uh, they, they, they're tough for me because it seems like he's inviting us to be doormats, to be people that just uh, get wronged and take it and try to put on a nice smile while we're doing that. And Um, When I was in college, I studied theology, and I took a class on conflict and peacemaking, and I wrestled and studied with um, a segment of the the theological spectrum called pacifism, and I had a hard time then with uh, this idea that we're supposed to turn the other cheek and resist in a nonviolent way. Um, On top of that, as a person, I'm somewhat naturally timid. I don't run toward conflict I'm a middle child, so I love using humor to, like, diffuse situations and uh, cut the tension in the room. Uh, I don't naturally love uh, conflict. If it's fight or flight, I'll find a way to flee but make you laugh while I'm doing it. So, um, and I, I don't, if I'm honest, don't love that part of me. And so I've done a lot of work with Jesus to try to not um, give in to what's natural to me. And so I've taken great, great courage in the Jesus of the scriptures that clears the temple with a whip. And Paul, who encourages Timothy to not live with a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and self-discipline. 
I'm drawn to those verses. And in fact, that verse from Paul to Timothy has been a bit of like a a life verse for me. Something I'm trying to not, uh, I don't want to be a timid person. And here Jesus apparently is telling us to timidly turn the other cheek. And so I'm, I'm wrestling with this text today. This, these words kind of rub me the wrong way. Because I don't think any of us in here want to be known as doormats, people that are taken advantage of. of. I don't think any of us wake up with that as a goal for our day. Um, so what is Jesus saying here? We got to get it right. And as I w- wrestled with these words and thought about how they might apply to us, I don't think that Jesus is inviting us here to be passive, to be people that are taken advantage of. Because remember, this book of Matthew is a call to Jesus's kingdom to a new way, a new society that he's establishing on the earth and how we're to live in relationship to King Jesus. And I think Jesus here is orienting us to his kingdom, to the way that he knows that is best. I think that Jesus is calling us to a better way of living in the world, a more powerful way of undoing evil. Because I think uh, what Jesus is doing here is calling us to a generous life, not a life of scarcity, Not a life of payback, but a generous life. And as we live a generous life, we will bring the kingdom of God where we go. And I think we will undo those cycles of evil that are all around us. As we live generously, as we put these words into practice, we will start to enjoy life in his generous kingdom. Because that's the only way I can explain these words. And these actions that Jesus is laying out, turning the other cheek, going the extra mile, these are generous actions. That's the only way I can make sense of these. But a generous life is not easily obtained. It truly is like a narrow road that few find. Living generously is not automatic. And I think Jesus understands and knows how strong our desire for revenge and payback is. It's truly, truly counterintuitive to not seek revenge. It's why it makes headlines anytime somebody forgives somebody who's murdered a loved one of theirs, because we understand revenge and payback. We don't fault people for those feelings. And if we're honest, I think we kind of like stories of revenge and payback. We like justice. We like people getting what they deserve. At least I do. Maybe I'm the only one here. Let's take, for instance, these, uh, these movie characters. What do they all have in common? Aside from being uh, some of my all-time favorite movies, um, these are all stories and characters who are built around revenge and payback. And these are movies I, I, I kind of hope to pay, play a few clips in, but for the sake of time and for the sake of not showing bloody uh, war scenes in church, I opted not to. I really wish I could. I watched a couple of them this week as sermon prep. Um, <laughs> But uh, these are all stories of revenge and payback. Revenge makes for great storytelling, right? Great cinema. I mean, can you imagine how boring it would be if Maximus had forgiven Commodus for his cowardly and brutal behavior? If that was the point of Gladiator, that would not have been a blockbuster success. Or what if Liam Neeson had turned the other cheek instead of using his special set of skills to... Uh, rescue his daughter who'd been taken and uh, destroy the, the Russian underground human trafficking ring that, in that movie. I mean, what if Amigo, uh, Inigo Montoya had forgave the six-fingered man who murdered his father? I mean, the princess bride would have been without so many memorable scenes and quotes if that would have been, if, these, if that character would have followed Jesus' words here. Payback seems right and good to us. And it's entertaining. It's good. It makes for good stories. And on a more serious note, those of us that lived through 9-11 remember how quickly our divided nation unified around the idea of payback. Democrat and Republican alike would have been furious if our president had stood up and quoted these words from Jesus about turning the other cheek. We would have said, get out of here. We're, we're, we're not about that. Yeah, we can't all get along, but if you mess with us, you're getting all of our wrath and payback. I've never seen a, a, t- a time of more national unity than that, those days after that attack 20 years ago. But we should recognize unity built around revenge and payback is short-lived. It's short-lived, and we quickly go back to our normal squabbles 
once we forget those feelings of revenge. But these feelings of revenge and payback are not just out there in movies or in national war policy. They're right in here, if we're honest. There's a desire in here to make things right, and it's a powerful desire. We might not always act on it, but we will think things and dream about things that are not uh, uh, in line with our normal disposition. Take, for instance, just a month ago, Katie, my wife, was out of the state, and so I had the five kids for the weekend, and uh, I won't call it babysitting, but it looked a lot like that, um, but I'm not allowed to call it babysitting. Um, you can't babysit your own kids, apparently. So uh, I have the two younger ones inside with me, and the three older boys are outside playing football, and I hear tires screeching which is a really bad sound to hear when your kids are playing out in front. So I run outside. I'm relieved to see that they're okay, but they're shaken up, telling me that they were almost hit by a car speeding down the street. And our neighbor saw it, and they were all upset, describing what the car looked like and who the driver was. And so I keep it together to try to comfort them. They're okay. I'm trying to play calm. And then I just decide, hey, guys, let's get in the van and go for a drive. Um, So uh, I, um, I don't really know... What I'll do, but I want to find this guy. And I, I normally carry a pocket knife with me. And so as I'm driving around, I develop this, this plan. I'm going to find this car, and I'm going to stick my knife in all four of his tires. I'm not kidding. I was going to do this. And then, um, and then I'll knock on his door, and I'll just inform him, that's the last time you'll speed down my street. And so um, that was my plan. Now, Unfortunately, I couldn't find my pocket knife anywhere, which is really rare for me. I always have it with me. I'm like, where is it? So to take my premeditated revenge even further, I go on Amazon and I buy this pocket knife. And I make sure it'll arrive as quickly as possible. I pay for quicker shipping because I don't want to miss this window for revenge. Um, So um, now, thankfully, I couldn't find the car anywhere. Um, And the knife takes a little longer to get here, so I'm without my weapon. Um, And one of my kids has the audacity to suggest we pray for this guy that sped down the street. I'm like, not today, you know, not not now. And so, but I'm thankful that I was backed away from that cliff. I was ready to make a really bad decision while I'm the sole guardian of my kids with my wife out of state. I mean, that would have not been good. Like, so Mike, how'd you lose custody of your kids this weekend? Um, Well... You don't speed down McCormick Drive, not on my watch. So, um, so what's going on here what, with all these feelings? Why do we love stories of revenge and payback? Why do we daydream? I'm, I'm in a natural, non-confrontational kind of person. And why, in an instant, would I be willing to, like, like destroy somebody's property and fight them uh, because they've, I feel wronged? What is going on with us here? I think it has something to do with our orientation to God's kingdom what Jesus is describing here in the book of Matthew. Our need for retaliation, I think, is directly related to the level of hope we have in the coming kingdom. We truly must have an eternal perspective or we will continue to get revenge. If this life is all that we have, you should certainly work to protect and fight for your property, your your reputation, your rights, your liberty. If this is it, then sure, sure, revenge and payback makes a ton of sense. But if you're hoping for a coming kingdom, a kingdom of justice, of generosity, of joy and peace, then perhaps you should consider following a different way, following a different route when evil comes at you. I think of Jim Elliott, that young missionary that was martyred um, along with his other missionaries by a tribe in Ecuador that they were trying to reach with the gospel. And Jim and his friends, they had guns with them to protect themselves. And when they're confronted with these Uh, these, this violent tribe, they chose not to use their weapons, uh, which would have protected them well against the spears of the tribe, but they chose not to because they knew they were living with an eternal perspective. They had a hope of a coming kingdom. And this, these tribe, this, these tribes people were not ready to meet Jesus in their death. So the, the, the the missionaries decided to not use force to defend themselves. And, And Jim is famously quoted as writing in his journal, he is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Jim had an eternal perspective. He is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. 
As we live a generous life, we'll bring the kingdom of God and we'll undo the cycle of evil around us. And if you know the end of this story, you know that uh, Jim Elliott and the other missionaries' family chose to forgive, chose to not retaliate. And many of people in that tribe, including some that threw the spears into the backs of their fathers and their husbands, came to know Jesus. And their lives were transformed. That violent tribe was transformed, all because they chose to live generously and not retaliate. They chose generosity over payback. So let's just unpack this uh, section of the book of Matthew. So if you've been tracking with us, you know that there's a a common kind of form that Jesus is using. He says, you've heard that it was said, where he quotes a part of the law. And then he says, but I say to you, where he has the audacity to fulfill fulfill and um, uh, clarify the law in himself. And then he usually gives us a few steps to follow, simple steps that are challenging, but they're simple. They're pretty straightforward. So that's uh, true in this text. So first he says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Jesus quotes here a familiar part of the law that's called the lex talionis. And it comes from Exodus 21, verse 23 through 25. I'll read it. It says, but if there's harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. The lex talionis is Latin for the law of the tooth. And it's a famous law because much um, of our society is built around it. Our justice system is built on this idea that uh, retribution must be fair and even. The punishment should fit the crime. And Jesus, God, when he gave this law to his people, he wanted this new community that's wandering through the desert to know that their community should be built around justice and fairness. But you see, this law was directed to uh, judges to implement, not individuals to, to put into practice. Because God knows if it's up to me to enforce an eye for an eye, it's not fair. If you knock out one of my eyes, I'm going to knock out two of your eyes. You knock out one of my teeth, I'm going to knock out all of your teeth. You speed down my street, I'm going to slash all four of your tires. Like, this is the way it works if it's left up to us. So this was an instruction to an impartial judge to institute fair retribution. Okay, there's an injury here, a burn here, then we got to burn you in the same way. That's fair. And, that's, uh, and that is up to the judges to enforce. God knew that it left up to us, payback and revenge would just escalate. And it wouldn't be fair. So this law was given to the Israel community, Israeli community to limit revenge, to keep it from getting wildly out of hand among them. That's why God gave them this law. But then Jesus says, but I say to you, he wants to take it even further because he knew, I'm sure in his day, people were taking retaliation into their own hands. So Jesus is saying, I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Now, this word resist is interesting. I don't understand fully what it means, but it's not as simple as just saying don't do anything to prevent the evil. Uh, This idea of resist carries with it an idea of payback. And so what Jesus is saying when he says don't resist the one who's evil is saying don't fight fire with fire. Don't play the same game as the evil person. That's what the word resist is saying. Don't do what they're doing. Don't do back to them what they're doing to you. Because we're, 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 we know we're not supposed to be passive, right? We're commanded in the New Testament to resist the devil. Like we're supposed to actively resist the evil one. So what is Jesus saying here? Don't resist the one who is evil. I think he's saying, yeah, you can resist the, the, the devil, but don't resist um, the person that might be being used by the evil one to do evil things. Don't fight fire with fire. Don't get wrapped up in their game. Now, this is not a passive doormat thing that Jesus is calling us into, but it active choice to not get even, but instead undo evil in a more creative, effective kind of way. And so his small steps point to this next. He shows us how this looks in actual practice. And he gives us four little like vignettes, four little sentences. Um, One about turning the other cheek, one, one about a tunic and a cloak, one about going the extra mile, and one about being generous. So what do these mean? And the first one is probably the more, most famous one, turning the other cheek. You've probably heard of this. Even if you've not, not grown up in church, you've heard that Jesus was famous for saying, turn the other cheek. And I think um, this is a tough one. Now, I don't think that Jesus is saying this is an attack on a person's life or health, and they should just take it. 
If I was to invite somebody up on stage to demonstrate what a slap looks like, none of you would volunteer. But um, if I slapped somebody on the face, none of you would jump up and say, oh, no, I hope he doesn't die. Because a slap is not a threat to a person's life. And in fact, Jesus is talking about being smacked on the right cheek. And to get hit on the right cheek by a right-handed person means they're using the back of their hand, which in his culture and probably still in our culture is an insult. You're not trying to hurt the person. You're shaming that person. You're putting that person in their place. You're showing dominance over that person and embarrassing them publicly. And so Jesus is saying, when that happens to you, when shame is brought to you and you want to hide or fight, stand and face them again. Turn to them the other cheek as well. Don't hide in shame and take it upon yourself and act like a doormat, but stand and turn and face your attacker, your accuser, the one who is putting shame on you. I like what Frederick Dale Bruner says here. He says that Jesus is advocating for an active poise, not a passive capitulation, not a pessimistic resignation. An active poise when you're slapped on the right cheek, when you're shamed and embarrassed, and somebody's trying to put you in your place. Notice Jesus does not say if somebody slaps your child on the cheek, turn to him the other child also. This is not a a license for us to get out of defending those who are in our care or speaking up for those who don't have a voice. This is not saying that we should avoid all conflict. I don't think this is licensed to stay in an abusive relationship. I don't think Jesus is saying if you're in physical danger, you should stay there and take it and keep taking it. In fact, standing and turning and facing your accuser and turning to them the other cheek as well could mean calling the authorities for protection and calling your pastors for spiritual covering and help. I don't think Jesus is saying keep being abused. That's not what he's saying. He's saying when you are covered in shame and publicly embarrassed, don't fight fire with fire and embarrass them back or hide your face in shame, but turn your face toward them and show them I am not a person that is covered in shame. In fact, I could could do this all day, meaning I could be, I can take shame all day. All right, and then he says, if somebody sues you and takes your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. There's two main types of clothing, the tunic and the cloak. Tunic was worn under your clothes, so it's kind of your underwear. It's kind of loose fitting, so we're not talking about uh, briefs here, Um, but that was what they wore under the clothes. So he's saying if somebody's trying to sue you for your underwear, give them your coat as well. Now, your cloak is what you, uh, if you were a poorer person, you would wear at night to stay warm. I mean, and it was almost forbidden to take somebody's cloak because of that, to leave them out in the elements. That was like really looked down upon. So here, if you can imagine this court scene, you're there, and Jesus is saying, instead of defend your right for your tunic and fight for it, give them your cloak as well. And what happens if you give them your cloak and they already have your tunic? You're naked in court saying, look, my life is not built around my property. I'd rather go naked than fight and squabble over something as small as a tunic. I I don't have a claim on my property. I'm not trying to hold on to what is mine. I'm not going to get into a petty squabble over property. And that's only possible if you have that eternal perspective. You will undo the cycle of evil by being generous and exposing the kind of person that would be so petty as to take somebody's tunic. Or say, here, take my cloak as well. And then not, they're all of a sudden embarrassed and realizing that, oh, now everybody knows it's them that takes the cloak as well and leaves a person exposed and in the elements. So turn to the other cheek, give them your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Now, in that day, a Roman soldier who was occupying Israel had the right to demand a subject carry their gear for a mile if they were tired of carrying it. And so this is what Jesus is referring to here. And he says, if that happens and they demand you to take a mile, go with them one mile and they'll go with them two miles. And this is an attack on your liberty. So if the first one is an attack on your pride and your self of sense of worth, the second one was an attack on your property. This is an attack on your freedom. They're, they're demanding that you stop what you're doing in your day and help them out and you have nothing, you cannot object. But Jesus is saying, go the second mile and show them, no, I am in fact a free person. And as a free person, I'm going to do it again. I'm choosing to go the extra mile. Not because you're forcing me, not because I'm some doormat, or because you can tell me what to do. I'm going to go with you a second mile. 
And in fact, that soldier might get in a little bit of trouble if they're no, uh, caught forcing somebody to go, to, with, to go with them a second mile. Jesus is saying, undo the cycle of evil by shocking that oppressive person, by doing the unthinkable, using your liberty to go above and beyond what is being asked of you as a free person. And then uh, lastly, he says, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. This is when your generosity is being taken advantage of. Jesus is saying, this is how you should behave. Give to the one who begs from you. I think that phrase, the one who begs from you, is implying it's a person who's actually in need. Somebody who is begging for help. Give to that person. Be generous to that person. Undo the cycle of evil by not holding on to what's yours and giving to those who are actually in need. And give to the one who wants to borrow from you. And you know how borrowing turns into more borrowing. Have you figured this out? Every one of you that let me borrow your truck while I was moving will be asked again for your truck when I move again, right? This is what happens. You let her borrow that coat, and then the next time she's going out, she's calling you to borrow that coat again. And Jesus is saying, keep giving. Keep letting people borrow your stuff. Don't give in to the, this is mine, and looking out for myself. Give to the one who's asking of you. And do not hold back. These actions put into focus that God is our supply chain. Our life is a vapor. If we have an eternal perspective hoping for the coming kingdom, what is our lawnmower or that truck or that coat? I mean, we should let everyone have access to it that needs it. If we're living for a coming kingdom that's full of generosity, if we live as generous people when we're attacked in our our sense of self-worth and attacked in our property or our sense of liberty or taken advantage of, our generosity is taken advantage of. If we live as generous people, we will undo the cycles of evil that are all around us. But Jesus didn't promise that these strategies would work to convert that person or that soldier or the one who's suing you. He didn't say that it would fix them, but I think he's promising it will convert us to his kingdom as we choose to live in a generous kingdom. You see, revenge is a powerful force. Like I said, it will cause us to do things we didn't think we would do. And if we're going to give up that powerful thing, we got to know that Jesus is handing us something even more powerful by telling us to turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, give to the one who asks things from. This is a powerful strategy that he's giving us to undo the evil that is coming at us. So my initial wrestle with these words is starting to diminish. I'm starting to see Jesus' intention for us here, what he's up to. Because Jesus knows if I take matters in my own hands, we're just going to make it worse. The punishment won't fit the crime. Jesus is calling us into a generous kingdom. And his generous kingdom won't move forward if we're just looking out for keeping what is ours. The kingdom of God will not move forward if we're hell-bent on holding on to our things, our reputation, our time. It just doesn't work that way unless we're living open-handed. But as we take Jesus seriously... We will stop this cycle of evil. I think we will see it be undone all around us. But how on earth is that possible? Because I've never actually been slapped on the cheek in like a shameful kind of way. There's no Roman soldiers demanding that I take their stuff for a mile. And if there was, I'd just throw it in the car and drive it for a a minute. You know, it's, it's hard to relate. So how is this possible? I think the only way this is possible are seen in some words that we'll see later in our study in the book of Matthew. Matthew 16. Verse 24 through 27. This is only possible. This generous way of living when wrongs are done to us is only possible as we come to the cross. Because Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, meaning if anyone wants to follow me into this kingdom way, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will repay each person according to what he's done. So remember, Jesus is orienting us in this text in Matthew 5 to his kingdom, a generous kingdom, generous with our honor, generous with our liberty and our possessions. And Jesus only gives us two options in order to do that. He says, you can deny yourself and follow me, or you can deny me and follow yourself. It's real clear. 
The only way to live as generous people is to first deny ourselves. You have to have a level of self-forgetfulness if you're going to turn the other cheek or give to the one who wants to borrow from you. You have to kind of, the self has to shrink and fade into the background and Jesus must increase as you follow him. The only way we'll be turning cheeks, receiving humiliation, is if we agree that it's better not to gain the whole world and lose our souls, but it's better to gain a soul that is centered in the kingdom of God. The only possible way that we'll be generous with our possessions and give to that person who again is asking from us is if we see and know and believe that Jesus is coming again and will reward us for what we've done on this earth. He's not just saying be a doormat. He's saying, I'm showing you a better way to live in a generous kingdom, a better way to undo evil all around you. So I'd like to leave us with a few kind of handles to hold on to so that we're not left up in theoretical land and like, oh, this is hard. I don't know how we'll ever do this. Well, again, it's only possible first when we come to the cross. Your life has to be oriented around the cross of Jesus, denying yourself and taking up your cross and following him. After that happens... So if you're not a follower of Jesus here, first take care of that. Don't go out and try to do good deeds and turn the other cheek. First follow Jesus. First know him at the cross and receive his gift of mercy and reconciliation that's found at the cross. But after we do that, I would suggest moving into Romans chapter 12. It's a fantastic chapter with some really practical, tangible ways to live out the way of the kingdom. So I just want to highlight a couple of verses in it. Romans uh, 12 verse 2 says, don't be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the first practical step you can do is get a brand new mind. There's no way you're going to be turning the other cheek and going the extra mile unless you get new thoughts up here. Renew your mind. Imagine a just future where God is going to make all things right and good and wonderful, and beautiful. Saturate your mind with images of the kingdom, a generous kingdom where you will have no lack, where nothing good and right and true and beautiful will be lost from you. Set your mind on that future. Don't let the payback culture shape your thinking. Let the scriptures and its image of the kingdom to come start shaping your thoughts. If you can win the battle of the mind, you will start to undo the cycle of evil by living generously around you. Don't spend time, I mean, I, guys, honestly, I spend, sometimes I don't even think about it. I'm just caught up in daydreams about how I'm going to get back at the person or win that argument. When they bring that up again, I'm going to say this. And I start to get, my mind is just saturated in payback. What if we instead weren't, didn't allow our minds to be conformed to the image of this world, but transformed into a brand new kingdom mentality? Verse 9 of chapter 12 in Romans says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, meaning hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Jesus is not telling you to name slaps on the cheek as good. He's not saying, hey, just think it's good when the Roman soldier asks you to go that mile. No, it's evil. Name it as evil. Hate that evil so much that you want to cling to the good and undo it in the way of Jesus, in the non-retaliation way of Jesus of living generously. Hate the evil, cling to what's good. Verse 14 says, bless those who persecute you. Pray, or bless and do not curse them. I would suggest that you learn to pray for people that are wronging you. As soon as my kid suggested I pray for that guy speeding down my street, my heart starts melting. It's really hard to get payback when you're praying for somebody. Bless them, pray for them. Not because they deserve it, not because you're trying to pretend they're good, but because Jesus is calling you to live a different way in his generous kingdom. Verses 17 to 21 says, repay no one evil for evil. This is that fighting fire with fire kind of thing. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Now, there's a lot here, but can you just hear the, the, the way of Jesus in that? Don't fight fire with fire, but live generously when faced with evil. Now, the main thing I think to hold on to here is that vengeance is God's. So God is not saying payback will never come. He's not saying, hey, don't, don't focus on getting revenge because it's bad. Jesus is saying, no, just pass that revenge out to the future to me. 
where I will make all things right. Remember the lex talionis was meant for impartial judges to to execute, right? So Jesus is saying, I'm the impartial judge. Trust me with vengeance and payback. Vengeance will come. The people that have wronged you will get what is their due, but it won't come through your hands. Through your hands will come the undoing of evil by living generously. Jesus is saying, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Now, just a few other just tips, I guess, to walk this out. First, um, learn to walk in forgiveness, like quickly forgive. Uh, a prayer I've tried to work into my daily routine is I forgive everyone, everything. And it's beautiful to pray that out loud. And I love the preemptive strike of choosing, as long as it depends on me, I'm going to live at peace with people. I forgive everyone, everything. Sure, specific people will come to mind that you need to forgive, but it's just nice to just declare, like, I'm going to live in forgiveness. That is a great way to live generously. I would also suggest a practical way to live this out is coming at you right now in the holidays, right? You're going to be around the table with people that have wronged you, that annoy you, that don't deserve your generosity. Look for openings in the, for the kingdom around the Thanksgiving table. Buy that family member a present that they don't deserve. Don't escalate that typical conversation into the normal argument that you always get in with your brother-in-law. And don't run and hide either, but stand and face it in a generous sort of way, listening generously to them. Look for openings for the kingdom. Another handle I would give you is, like, redefine your relationship with social media. Really, it is hard to live generously on social media because you're, like, working against algorithms that are, like, built to get you worked up and built to get you not, like, turning the other cheek is not a good business model for Instagram and Twitter. They want to get us riled up. Reconsider your relationship with uh, social media. I think it's hard to live generously on those spaces with people. And you're not convincing anybody on them. You're not winning any arguments. I, I guarantee it. And the gospel is probably not being multiplied throughout the earth because we're all on Instagram and Twitter. I mean, I just don't think it's the case uh, that we're going to change people's minds on those platforms. Just reconsider your relationship with those things. Maybe let's go back to cat videos. Let's go back to cat videos. And uh, finally, I'll, I'll invite the worship team to come on up as we uh, prepare to respond. The final thing I would uh, encourage you with is to apply the cross and the resurrection to your life on a daily basis. So Galatians 2 verse 20, I would get used to praying this over your life. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is true for your life. Now pray that into your life on a daily basis. Bring the cross of Christ over your relationships, over your emotions, over your property, over your time. Jesus, I apply the work of your cross to my life. Thank you for atoning for my every sin and forgiving me. I receive it and your blood over my life. And Jesus, I apply the work of your resurrection to my relationships and my property and my, my liberty and my sense, of, uh, my sense of right and wrong. I, I just apply the resurrection of Christ to it. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in you, Jesus, in the Son of God. Get used to praying those verses over your life. That is a really practical step to take in living a generous life and being one who undoes evil all around you. It brings the kingdom because you're living in this way. And so we're going to respond now in worship and in prayer. There's going to be people up front that would love to pray for you. It could be about something that came up for you uh, from these verses, but we'd love to pray for you about anything. It could be the Thanksgiving dinner that you're getting ready for and you're stressed out about. It could be something going on at work or in marriage. I don't know. Just come and get prayer. Don't, don't, don't take this stuff and, and work it out on your own. Come and get prayer. And we're all going to worship. Now, this is not an optional time in our service. This is Like, church is not over. we got time that we're going to create some space to to worship Jesus and look to him as we do this. But I think the best way that we can respond and put into practice this generous way of living in the kingdom is coming to this table. It's the best way to orient ourselves to the generous kingdom. Because here we remember the body that is broken and the blood that was poured out to make us friends of God. We who are his enemies, we who are far from him, are brought near by the spilled blood and the broken body of Jesus Christ. Because we were a part of the crowd that was shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Let him get what is his. 
And Jesus had every right to pay us back and to get revenge and retribution on us as enemies. But no, he instead turned that bruised and bloody cheek back to get another blow. He died naked, giving up not just his tunic, but his outer garment as well, without a possession to his name. He went the extra mile, carrying a burden on that cross that was meant for us to carry. And we demanded that he carry it. And he did. And he gave. And he gave. And he gave to the ones who begged from him. The ones who needed from him, he gave of himself. Let this table remind us of our generous king. Jesus is not calling you to go somewhere he's not willing to go himself. He's gone there before you. He's saying, take up your cross and follow me. That's the the direction I'm going. Don't you want to be going the direction of Jesus? Not the direction of yourself, your small little kingdom, trying to win your arguments and keep what is yours. I want to go the way of Jesus. So let's stand together. Jesus, we recognize you as generous. You're generous. Your kingdom is generous. And we fix our hope on your kingdom that will come. So Lord, in song and prayer, as we come to the table, I pray you'd uproot the stinginess of our culture, the selfishness of our own souls. Uproot it, Lord, and put in us hearts of generosity, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Come forward and get prayer. Come to the table when you're ready. Let's respond. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. Beautiful thing.